In this video, we're going to be going over Chapter 7, looking at the idea of decision making and see what it is that managers can do as far as uh, making decisions and improving some of their decision making. We basically have rational and non-rational decision making approaches. Now, a decision is basically just making a choice. Okay? The decision making can be made from rational or not irrational, but something a little different as far as the, uh, the approach is concerned. Now, the rational model of the decision making uh, that the book talks about is how decisions should be made. Basically, now what they have in the book are these four stages here, identifying the problem, coming up with solutions, evaluating alternatives in those various solutions and selecting one, and then implementation. One of the things that I found that they tend to miss in this kind of a model is the idea of agreeing on required and optional guidelines. In other words, here's a particular problem that we want to solve. Then, no matter what decision we come up with, what things have to be met? What are the guidelines that we have? What are the, uh, not necessarily rules, but uh, what are the things that have to be met no matter what? For example, when my wife and I were going to build a house, our problem or opportunity is building a house. And then what we did was we said, okay, what are some things that we have to have in the house no matter what? Well, one of the things was we wanted two stories. That was required. Another thing we wanted was the laundry upstairs where all of the dirty clothes were, not down in the basement or anything like that. That was required. We wanted a walkout basement. That was required. And then we had some other things uh, as far as uh, the way the land sloped and things like this that were optional. And what it did was it allowed us to look at various opportunities and different uh, plans and lots and decide which one would actually be best for us. So first you identify the problem or opportunity and then think about what are those guidelines that are necessary, what's required and what's optional. Then you start thinking up solutions. Then what you do is you run those solutions against those guidelines. See which ones stay. Evaluate the alternatives and then select one. The one that beats all the guidelines is the one that you use. And then what you do is you implement and evaluate. Now this is the rational model as far as making decisions is concerned. Now in the book it talks about what's wrong with it. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, all right? The rational decision-making approach really does work well, especially when you're dealing with groups, and we'll talk about that here in just a bit. There are some downsides to it. In other words, in the rational decision-making model, the assumption is you have perfect information. In other words, you have all the information that's there, it's all complete, things like that. That doesn't happen. Another assumption is the people who are making the decision are logical and unemotional. Well, people will always come with their own biases, will always come with their own emotions, no matter what. And then what is the best decision for the organization? Many times you get politics and some of the personal things coming into play so that, that the uh, identifying of the different options and things like this don't necessarily agree. There are some hindrances to finding that perfect rational decision making. In other words, complexity. It may be a very complex problem that you're dealing with and you can't get all of the information because of time and money constraints. Maybe you have different cognitive capacities as far as the various team members, imperfect information. All of these things come into play that get in the way of true rational decision making. Now the non-rational models are the things that's typically used. You have a person who is making a decision. Many times there is a non-rational approach to making that decision. One of the things that comes into play is what's called bounded rationality. Bounded rationality. Basically, you don't have the cognitive capacity to handle all of the possible opportunities, challenges, options that are out there. Sometimes you have a real constraint as far as time and money. And so these things will bound how much and how well you can actually work through the decision. 
So then what happens is we satisfice. Satisficing is basically saying, what's the decision that makes, that is the best one at this point in time? Based on the information that we have, what is the best one? For example, if you are going to buy a car, we typically will look for cars in a small area that's around. There's a lot of cars out there. There's a lot of uh, car dealers and things. And you have a tendency to satisfy. And the reason is because you're finding a car that is good enough for what it is that you're looking for. I always challenge people. Well, did you look in, say, Detroit? Could you have gotten a better, uh, a, a better deal in Detroit or maybe in Denver or something along those lines? People say, no, well, I didn't look there. Well, we have a tendency to satisfy. And the reason is because time and money and the cognitive capacity and things get in the way of finding the perfect decision. Many times what happens is our intuition comes into play when we are making a decision. You have a lot of people who have some expertise, a lot of expertise in certain areas. For example, uh, a carpenter. You have a carpenter who's been working as a carpenter for 20 years. Well, there's a lot of learning that's in there and wisdom and experience that comes into play when a problem comes up, this carpenter knows exactly what to do. And it, it's just intuitive as far as what the decision is and what has to happen based on all of that experience and wisdom. We also have to think about ethics whenever we're making decisions. Ethics is making sure that we're choosing right or wrong as far as our behavior is concerned. And many times, as far as ethics are concerned, we're working through a decision tree as far as that decision is concerned. I and mean, we've seen this before in chapter three. Is it legal? If it's not, don't do it. Stay away from it. That's the bottom line. If it is legal, does it maximize value somehow? If it does, okay, well then, is it really ethical? If it yes, yeah, then do it. If it's not ethical, don't do it. If it's not necessarily maximizing value, would it be ethical to not take the action? If that's the case, then don't do it. If it's not, go ahead and do it, but make sure people understand what the impact and what the reasoning is. A lot of the decisions that's coming out today are really trying to focus more on evidence-based management. In other words, what's the best evidence, the best facts that are out there in making our decisions? It's bringing more rationality to that process. Now, it makes it hard to be evidence-based when there's too much. In other words, you just get inundated with too much information. Maybe the evidence that you have is not good enough. In other words, you don't have complete information. You have a lot of stuff, but not complete. Maybe the evidence that you have really doesn't apply, or you see people who are trying to mislead you, things like that. And so many times there's going to be things that get in the way of being completely evidence-based. One of the things that's becoming big in business today is what's called analytics. In other words, what you're doing is you're using computer data to actually pull the information together and start helping making uh, decisions that are really the best ones. One of the things that happens is, or one of the tools that's being used, is what's called predictive modeling. In other words, being able to take the data that you're getting and be able to predict future behavior with it. Now, I'm sure everybody's heard the term big data. Every time we go out on the internet someplace, we're leaving footprints. If you think about what it is that you do, whenever you go out to Facebook or you're using Google or something like that, they're showing you ads. Those ads that you're getting in your browser are based on websites that you have visited in the past. What's happening is Google and Facebook and all of these other tech companies are using big data. They're tracking where you go. Based on that, they're going to show you advertisements that will hopefully entice you to buy something from their customers. It's called that big data analytics where they're pulling together a lot of unknown information, a lot of detail as far as that data is concerned and trying to make sense of it. The way it's being used looking at consumer behavior and getting more sales. In other words, there's the advertisements that come out because of where it is that you've been. Improving hiring. 
In other words, getting the right people on the bus. Uh, exploiting farm data. In other words, what is it that farmers are actually doing? What is it that they could do to improve their yields? Advancing mat, uh, health and medicine. There's all kinds of uses for big data. If you want to make a lot of money going down the road, one of the things you want to do is start thinking about learning more about how to use big data. In other words, learning about programming uh, using R and Python, understanding data visualization. So these are things that can help you in your, in your career going forward. There's different decision-making styles. In other words, what's the typical way that we tend to make our decisions? And it's a balance between our values and our tolerance for an ambiguity. So it's a balance between these two things, values and amb ambiguity. If, based on your values, you have more of a focus on the task and technical concerns, or you can have a focus that's based more on people and social concerns. When it comes to tolerance for ambiguity, you could have a low or a high tolerance for ambiguity. If your values are focused more on task and technical things and you have a low tolerance for ambiguity, you're going to be much more directive as far as your decision-making style. In other words, it's going to be fairly quick. It's going to be, okay, here's a little bit of data. All right, let's go with this. If you're more focused on task and technical with a high tolerance for ambiguity, you have a tendency to be more analytical, gather much more data, look at all that data, do everything you can to get to it. If you focus more on the people aspect and you have a low tolerance, this tends to be more behavioral approach and then conceptual for high people and high tolerance for ambiguity. The different biases that we have when it comes to making decisions really do come into play. You have the availability bias. In other words, based on what's just available, the information that's just readily available, making your decision based on that. Representative bias. In other words, there's something that happened in the past, therefore you have a tendency to generalize and it'll always happen in the future. Confirmation bias. In other words, you focus in on the things that you agree with. Sunk cost bias. Basically that's saying, okay, we've already spent a bunch of time and money on this. Uh, this must still be the best thing to do. Anchoring and adjustment. And the Example that was used in the book was the idea of raises for people based on their previous salaries. They get a certain percentage based on the previous salaries. They anchor it based on the previous salaries. The adjustment would be the raise. Overconfidence. In other words, many times we have more confidence than we really should as far as how much we know and what it is we can do. Hindsight bias is basically saying, yeah, I knew that. I knew that after it was done. And so these are various biases that come into play when we're making decisions. Artificial intelligence is something where you're trying to get over some of the biases and actually let the computers make mistakes or make the decisions as far as what it is you're trying to do. I'm sure you've heard about the driverless cars that's all using artificial intelligence. In other words, it's the computer is taking in a bunch of different data and making decisions as far as where that car should go, how fast it should go, that sort of thing. Whenever you have groups that are together, they're going to be making decisions. Many times groups can make better decisions than individuals. There are other times when individuals can actually make better decisions than the group. With the group, you have some advantages you have a greater pool of knowledge. So for example, if you have five people who are together, and they have a particular problem that needs to be solved. Different people are bringing different knowledge and wisdom to that problem. Having different perspectives was all, is also good. Some people are looking more outwardly. Some are looking more inwardly. Looking at those various perspectives and considering all of those can be very beneficial. The intellectual stimulation. In other words, having the conversations, going back and forth and sharing ideas can be very beneficial. Better understanding of the rationale. And then also, when you have people who are together and they're making the group 
decision together, you're going to have people who are much more committed to that decision. There are some downsides. In other words, you might have get just one or two people who are dominating the entire discussion. Many times a group will get together, they'll start discussing something, and if they're really not bought into it, they'll just satisfy us, pick whatever is good enough at that point in time. Other issues could come into play, or you may have a situation of groupthink. Groupthink was actually developed by a gentleman by the name of Irving Janus by looking at various presidential uh, administrations, primarily the Kennedy administration and the Bay of Pigs. What happens with groupthink is you have people who are part of a very cohesive group and they are very dedicated to that group. It's good to be a part of that group. They want to be a part of that group. They want to do what that group wants to do. And so consequently, a decision will be made because well, the other folks in this group think that it's the right thing. So I want to be a part of that group. So I'll go along with it. In other words, it's an illusion of unanimity and peer pressure. In other words, somebody doesn't say something and it's assumed that they're going along with it, that they agree. It's that whole idea of the wisdom of the crowds. Many times groupthink will take you down the wrong path. When you have group decision making, there are some things that are the downsides besides the groupthink. Many times they're less efficient because you're going to get much more in the way of discussion, people taking it different directions, things like this. Size is important. When I work with teams, the true teams, the best size teams are either five or seven people. The reason why I say five or seven is because if they vote, you don't have a tie. Many times groups will get together and they're too confident as far as what it is you're trying to do and making sure that knowledge counts. There are some practical guidelines when you're talking about group decision making. You use that group when you know that it can increase the quality of the decision. Different people are bringing different wisdom and you can get a better decision, especially when it increases acceptance to the decision. Because when people walk out of that room, you want them all with their heads nodding yes, they'll buy into it. And it can increase the various development of the skills that are going on that people have. Now, some of the techniques, consensus. Consensus is basically saying, I think that something else might be better, but I can agree to this 100% and support it. That's what consensus is. It's not necessarily unanimity. It's not just one person deciding. It's not a voting type thing. It's where people say, yes, I will support this when we walk out of the room. Brainstorming is not a problem solving technique. It is a solution generating technique. In other words, when you sit down and when you're brainstorming, you're trying to come up with as many different possibilities as possible. There are rules for a brainstorming session where you defer judgment. When I work with folks and they're going to be brainstorming, I tell them, okay, you want to capture every single idea that comes out. You write down every single idea. Do not poo-poo any ideas. If somebody says something you don't necessarily agree with or you think it's a stupid idea, don't say that idea sucks. What you do is you write it down. You just get everything that you possibly can. You try to build on other people's ideas. Encourage the wild thinking outside the box type stuff. You're trying to get quantity of ideas, not quality. Whole idea behind this is to get as many different ideas because one of the things that may come up may spark another idea in this person over here. And that may be the gem that you're actually looking for. You also want to have a devil's advocate within the group. In other words, somebody who is going to challenge some of the things that are being said, some of the directions that the group is going, so that you're not getting situations of groupthink. At the end of projects, one of the things you also want to do is what's called post-mortems. In other words, you step back at the end of a project and you say, okay, what went well? In other words, what are the things we want to repeat? What are some things that did not go as well that we could do differently next time? 
In the, in the military, they call it after action reviews. It's really important after a project, if you want to have a learning organization, you step back and you say what went well, capture that and post that someplace so that other project teams who are coming in behind you can learn from it. These are some key points from the chapter. If you have questions, give me a shot.